would like to welcome you to the 34th Annual Economic Seminar. And first and foremost, thank our sponsors, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, the Rochester Business Alliance, and a new sponsor, the CFA Society of Rochester. I'm Mark Zupan, proud dean of the Simon School of Business at the University of Rochester. Uh, we have uh, two speakers today. Uh, one, unfortunately, Jim Glassman, who's the chief economist for the Commercial Bank of J.P. Morgan, is going to be speaking from his home in Princeton. He was scheduled to fly up today. Uh, but uh, as you've probably read, uh, a third of our flight delays occur out of the New York City airports. And uh, we're the victim of uh, one of those delays today. Uh, we couldn't produce him in holographic form, but he will be uh, live uh, through another technological substitute. Would like to uh, next uh, acknowledge uh, Sandy Wolcott, who will introduce our first speaker, and uh, thank him and his firm, his bank, for their wonderful support over the years. Uh, Sandy's the chair of Chase Middle Market Banking for the Northeast segment. It stretches from Maine to the Carolinas and includes parts of Pennsylvania. Uh, in this role, he advises clients with $20 million in annual revenue uh, and helps the firm also gain new clients. He's a 43-year-old banking veteran, uh, started at the age of 15. Uh, Sandy's based out of our hometown of Rochester and has been with Chase and its predecessors for more than 30 years. Uh, prior to his current role as chair, he led the upstate New York commercial banking team for 15 years. And under his leadership, uh, the team and the market grew significantly and expanded to other regions, including central Pennsylvania, western Massachusetts, and Vermont. He also serves as the firm's senior executive for the upstate region across all lines of business. Uh, Sandy joined Lincoln First Bank, a predecessor of Chase, in 1979. He held several management positions before assuming his responsibilities in commercial banking in 93 and now to a senior role in 2003. We're also very proud of the fact that uh, the person he works with and the chair of overall commercial banking uh, for J.P. Morgan is an 89 Simon alum, Doug Petno. So without further ado, please join me in thanking J.P. Morgan and uh, welcoming Sandy Wolcott to the stand. Thank you, Mark. Um, I apologize for Mr. Glassman, uh, but we have some pluses and minuses here. First, the plus that I've ever had to be able to do is that he's on this little polycom phone, and it's the first time I've ever, ever been able to put Jim Glassman on mute. <laughs> S second of all, the good news and the bad news is, he, bad news is he didn't show up. The good news is he's on the on the, <coughs> on the speakerphone, he will be, and he can hear everything right now, just so you know that. Uh, and also, the, the, the even the better news, as you all know, who we've had him here before, Jim has a face for radio, so we're a lot better off. <laughs> so thinking about this the last couple of days, I was thinking about 2012, and some of the high and low points as we look at it, in that <coughs> the economy continued to recover despite the worries of, of, that the U.S. was going to be losing some g gas this spring, fear of the wheels coming off the Europe's monetary experiment, and panic about the looming physical cliff. Despite the economy's slow growth, unemployment fell by another full percentage point, and hiring held steady at around 153,000 on a monthly average. The Fed, thanks to <coughs> Mr. P Dr. Plosser, uh, poured a ton of money into <laughs> the economy with asset purchases uh, to promote a, uh, we hope, a faster economic recovery. Um, amid all this political bluster, uh, the, reg the negotiators accomplished something in the final seconds uh, that George W. Bush administration was never able to, to do, and that was to make the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts permanent. Uh, also, however, on the other side, Congress, as you probably know, punted on the spending cuts, which only delayed the inevitable here. Uh, on the corporate side, corporate profit margins, which began the year in record territory, held on. Mortgage rates continued to drop 
three and a quarter percent by the end of the year, a level that no one has ever really seen before. And the stock market rose another 14 percent, putting the fin uh, final touches on a complete recovery. So, no, not too bad, not too bad. Now, I'd like to introduce our only <coughs> existing speaker here, Dr. Charles Plosser, who is the president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. In his current role, he participates on the Federal Reserve System Federal Open Market Committee, which is responsible for conducting our nation's monetary policy. Dr. Plosser joined the Philadelphia Fed in 2006. He believes in a systematic approach to monetary policy to promote better economic outcomes and financial stability. He has also been a longtime advocate of the Federal Reserve's adopting an explicit inflation target, which the FOMC adopted in January of 2012. Before joining the Philadelphia Fed, Dr. Plosser was an economics professor at the University of Rochester Simon School, where he also served as dean from 1993 to, to 2003. He earned his MBA and his PhD degrees at the University of Chicago. Dr. Plosser. Thank you, Sandy. It's uh, always a pleasure to be back. I want to thank everyone for inviting me once again to be back in Rochester at this annual event. Um, it's kind of like old home week in many respects. I always enjoy coming back, seeing uh, old friends, and familiar faces. And it's even more fun when it's not snowing, which I think... Uh, so if Jim has a problem getting to Rochester today, it wasn't Rochester's fault. Um, <laughs> Now, as many of you know, our nation's central bank is made up of 12 Federal Reserve banks across the nation. Together with the Board of Governors in Washington, um, this decentralized structure of the Federal Reserve System helps ensure that monetary policy and decisions are based on the full breadth of economic conditions across our diverse nation. The goals of monetary policy, of course, are set by Congress in the Federal Reserve Act. And that states that the Fed should conduct monetary policy to, and I quote, promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. And I've long believed, and you've heard me, those of you who have been here before have heard me say that the most effective way I believe monetary policy can contribute to maximum employment and moderate long-term interest rates is by ensuring price stability over the longer term. Price stability is also a critical factor in promoting financial stability. Now, the Fed seeks to promote these objectives by influencing the cost and availability of credit through its decisions about interest rates, of course, and the supply of money. Now, those decisions, as you know, are the primary responsibility of the FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee, the group within the Fed that's charged with setting monetary policy. Now, by design, Policy is set by 12 voting members of the FOMC. The seven members of the Board of Governors in Washington always has a vote. They're political appointees, as you know, as does the president of the New York Fed. The remaining four votes come from among 11 other Reserve Bank presidents who serve on a rotating basis as voting members of the committee. But whether or not we vote, all Reserve Bank presidents contribute to the discussion and sit around the table and oftentimes it's true, if you didn't know who was voting, if you were just sitting there and listening, you couldn't tell who was voting and who was not. No, we may at times disagree amongst ourselves about how to best promote the outcomes we want. We do share the same goals and objectives as prescribed by the Federal Reserve Act. But this process ensures that the committee considers a wide range of independent assessments of the economy and of the policy options that we have available to us to pursue. And it is the independence of the reserve banks and their leadership that ensures that our central bank does not slip into a sort of groupthink mentality and that the perspective of policymakers extends beyond the Beltway or Wall Street and reflects the entire nation. With that in mind, I also have to, to note, as, as many of my colleagues always want me to, that my views are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System 
or the Open Market Committee. So let me begin with an overview of the economy as we enter 2013. We are now in the fourth year of an economic expansion that officially began in mid-2009. Yet economic growth has come in fits and starts, taking two steps forward and then to stall, only to then stall or take a step back. Yet the general path has continued to be forward, but we've made far slower progress than anyone would like. A year ago, many economists were forecasting that economic growth would be closer to 3% in 2012. Instead, the year-end data, which will be released later this month, we are likely to see that growth was only about 2% in 2012. I anticipate the pace of growth will pick up somewhat in the next two years, running about 3% in 2013 and 2014. That's a pace that's slightly above our long-term trend, which I'll have more to say about later. In December's projections by the FOMC participants, the central tendency of the members and the participants of the FOMC showed that real GDP growth was likely to fall between 2.3 and 3 percent in 2013 and between 3 and 3.5 3 percent in 2014. So my outlook, which is about for 3 percent for both years, puts me kind of at the high end of the forecast ranges for 2013. 13, but kind of on the low side for 2014. But over the course of the next two years, I'm right in the middle of that forecast. <clears throat> now this level of growth should, should allow for continued improvements in the labor market's conditions, including, I believe, a gradual decline in the unemployment rate, similar to the improvements in the unemployment rate we've seen over the last couple of years. For example, in the fourth quarter of 2010, the unemployment rate averaged 9.5%. By the fourth quarter of 2011, the average rate had fallen to 8.7%. We now know that the unemployment rate for the fourth quarter of 2012 came in at 7.8%. Thus, over the last two years, we've seen unemployment fall by 1.7 percentage points. I believe we will see this rate continue, or this downward trend to continue, at a similar pace as we've seen for the last couple of years, which suggests to me the unemployment rate is going to be near 7 percent by the end of 2013. So part of the challenge in this recovery has been the modest number of net jobs we've created. In 2012, the unemployment uh, employment growth averaged about 153,000 a month, about the same number that it averaged in 2011. The fact of the matter is we are just not adding jobs at a pace that allows us to rapidly bring down the unemployment rate. Now many people are understandably frustrated by this, the modest pace of this recovery, especially when it's compared to the recovery of 1981-82, which was also a severe recession. 1982, some of you may remember, the unemployment rate reached a peak of 10.8% noticeably higher than it did in this recession. Yet by the end of 1985, approximately three years after the peak of the unemployment rate, it had fallen by 3.8 percentage points to 7 percent three years after the peak. In contrast, today, about three years after the peak in the unemployment rate, which occurred in October of 2009, the rate has fallen only about 2.2 percentage points as opposed to 3.8. So it's not, it, it's not been as rapidly a recovery in unemployment as we saw in 81, 82. But recessions are not all alike. And to understand the dynamics of the recovery, including why this one has been relatively sluggish, we must understand the size and nature of the shocks that sent the economy into recession in the first place. We entered this recession overinvested in the housing and financial sectors. The adjustment in the housing market as a result of this boom and bust has been painful for the housing sector and for financial markets. Both those sectors have shrunk as a share of the economy, and labor and, ca labor and capital are being reallocated to other sectors. Indeed, it would not be particularly wise to seek to return those sectors to their pre-crisis highs. 
After all, we learned the hard, hard way that those highs were not sustainable. Moreover, the labor force needs to be at least partially retooled to match the skills that employers demand. Even within sectors, such as manufacturing, the skills of workers now being hired are often different from those who were let go. Employers are generally seeking higher skilled workers who are more technology savvy, who are better able to deliver on the increases in efficiencies that the firms have sought to achieve. This adjustment takes time. It's painful to be sure, but it will lead to a healthier economy in the longer run. The housing collapse also significantly reduced consumer spending, which accounts for about 70 percent of the nation's GDP. The sharp decline in housing values destroyed a lot of the equity that families had built up in their homes. Thus, a huge chunk of their savings vanished. Many households had been counting on that equity to send their children to college or to help fund their own retirement. With that wealth gone, it's only natural and rational for consumers to want to rebuild those savings. Consequently, private savings rates have risen substantially and consumption by households has been restrained. I believe these adjustments are unlikely to be significantly accelerated through additional government policies that attempt to stimulate so-called aggregate demand. I think this is especially true in the case of the ever more aggressive monetary policy accommodation by the central bank. The conventional view is that lowering interest rates, monetary policy lowers the price of consuming today relative to consuming in the future, thereby encouraging households to reduce savings and consume today, that is bringing future consumption forward. Consumers now, have, as I've noted in the current circumstances, consumers have a very strong incentive to save. They are trying to restore the health of their balance sheets so they will be able to retire or put their children through college. They are behaving wisely and in a perfectly rational and prudent way in the face of this reduction in wealth. In fact, low interest rates and large budget deficits can in fact frustrate those efforts to save. For example, low interest rates encourage households to save even more because the return on their savings is very small. If they're trying to rebuild their balance sheets through savings, it will force them to do even more of that in order to recover where they want to be. Large budget deficits suggest that, that they are likely to consumers that they are likely to face higher taxes in the future. That also encourages more saving. Thus, efforts to drive real interest rates ever more negative or promises to keep rates low for a very long time may, in fact, have frustrated households in their efforts to rebuild their balance sheets without really stimulating much aggregate demand or consumption. It's my view that until household balance sheets are restored to a level that consumers and households find comfortable, consumption will remain sluggish. This is likely to take some time and attempts to increase uh, economic stimulus may not speed up the process, may actually even prolong it. Manufacturing activity has also shown sluggish growth. Shown sluggish growth, boy. I'm surprised I got that out right. Anyway, the Philadelphia Fed's monthly business outlook survey of regional manufacturers has been a useful barometer of national trends in manufacturing for many years. The survey's general activity index posted negative numbers over the summer, then recovered briefly in the September and October, and then posted declines in November in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. In December, the index returned to positive territory. The good news is that the survey's future activity indexes, index still remains positive, and manufacturers continue to expect growth over the first six months of 2013. Even though the balance sheets of most corporations are in pretty good shape, we continue to hear stories of weak demand and a great deal of uncertainty. Domestic demand in the United States has slowed as consumers save more, as I've just described. Yet global demand has also slowed, due in large part to the economic turmoil in Europe, which is hovering in near recession. 
The slowdown has restrained world trade. U.S. exports have eased, and with it, so has our manufacturing sector. Uncertainty is another factor restraining hiring and invest in the investment process in businesses. The fiscal issues in Europe remain unresolved. While leaders in Europe have, at least so far, avoided the financial implosion that many feared, they are far from resolving the underlying fiscal issues they face. Of course, uncertainty is not limited to Europe. Many U.S. firms have taken a wait-and-see attitude, if you will, with respect to hiring and investment, as businesses and consumers wait to see how our own fiscal problems will be resolved. How much will tax rates go up? How much will government spending be cut? U.S. fiscal policy is clearly not, not on a sustainable path, and it must be corrected. Yet there remains a significant amount of uncertainty about the choices that will be made. And that uncertainty has been a drag on near-term growth. There have been a number of studies uh, recently and uh, through history, but more recently, that demonstrate that uncertainty, and uncertainty about policy in, 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 um, in particular, acts as a drag on both hiring by firms as well as investment decisions. Although recent, recent efforts by Congress have reduced some of this near-term uncertainty over at least personal tax rates, the long-term fiscal issues have not been fully addressed. However, we will have to wait and see if the somewhat greater clarity on near-term tax rates reduces some of the drag on businesses spending going forward. Here too, in my view, monetary policy accommodation that lowers interest rates is unlikely to stimulate firms to hire and invest until a significant amount of this uncertainty is resolved. Firms have the resources to invest and hire, but they are simply uncertain as to how to put those resources to their highest valued use. To sum up, there are good reasons to expect that the recovery will continue at a modest pace over the next couple of years. Turning to inflation, it's been running near our longer term goal of 2%. Although the drought in the Midwest and the higher gasoline prices during the summer pushed inflation up slightly, those effects have been waning. Thus, I do not see higher inflation or deflation in the near term. Indeed, over the medium to, medium to longer term, I expect that inflation will stay near our 2% target. But that expectation, in my view, is based on an assessment, my assessment, that appropriate monetary policy will likely have to tighten more quickly and sooner than the committee anticipated in its latest statement. So I do see some risk to medium and longer term inflation given the current stance and anticipated path of monetary policy. Now the shocks we have witnessed are large and likely to impact the economy for some time. During this period, the economy's level of output has been significantly reduced, and it's unlikely we will ever fully recover those losses. This is a painful and disruptive consequence of the imbalances and the shocks that have hit our economy. But what are the longer-term consequences of the Great Recession? Has the, has the economy's longer-term trend rate of growth been permanently reduced? This is a much harder question to determine and to, and to answer. And the answer will depend on part on the economic policies we choose in the aftermath of the recession. A simple way to assess long-term trend rate of growth is to think of the sum of labor productivity growth, which is typically measured as the growth of real output per worker or per output per hour's work, and labor force growth. Labor force productivity is averaging 1.5% per year, and the labor force is growing at about 1% a year, then you might reasonably anticipate that over a long period of time, the trend rate of growth of the economy would be about 2.5%. Over the longer term, labor force growth is mostly a demographic phenomenon, although economic policies can and do affect that as well. Japan is an interesting case. Let's suppose, for example, that its labor force um, productivity growth is 1.5% per year. But in fact, in Japan, the labor force growth, the growth rate of the labor force is actually declining 
at about 1% a year. A decline in the labor force in Japan is due in part to an aging population, low birth rates, and a fairly stringent immigration policies. So if Japan were experiencing 1.5% productivity growth and minus 1% labor, labor growth, their long-run trend rate of growth is only going to be about half a percent a year. Over the long run, productivity growth is, primary, uh, is, uh, is the primary determinant of rising living standards of per capita income. Over the shorter run, variations in labor force participation rates or the share of income going to labor versus capital can also affect it. But over the long run, these latter factors tend to be more stable, leaving productivity growth as the main determinant of per capita income growth. Without productivity growth, economies would stagnate, living standards would fall as the population increased. Thus, productivity growth is the essential ingredient for continued improvements in economic prosperity. Now, most economists view productivity growth as being determined over the long run by education, the quality of the labor force, innovation, and general enterprise. Of course, many factors can influence these drivers. Various government policies can support productivity growth. Others can dampen it. In this sense, societies face trade-offs and make choices. One way I like to think about these choices is a risk-return framework. Investors, for example, can choose strategies that are risky, with asset prices or returns that can be quite volatile. Yet the expected rewards for tolerating that volatility are higher over the longer run than those from adopting safe or what finance professors call risk-free strategies. Society can do the same thing. It can choose policies that potentially increase productivity and the returns to producti returns over the longer term. But those choices may result in more volatility in economic outcomes over time or perhaps even across citizens. Alternatively, a society can choose policies that are safe with little volatility, reducing uncertainty and fluctuations. But those choices could dampen projected growth. So what effects will the Great Recession have on long-term economic growth or productivity? I think our policy choices and how they affect incentives will matter importantly. Establishing training programs, investing in education, adopting immigration reform can increase the quality of our workforce and enhance future productivity growth. But policies that reduce labor and capital mobility could harm longer run growth. Attempting to eliminate volatility by creating expanded safety nets, if you will, for both individuals and institutions can stifle innovation and distort risk taking. This, too, could likely come at the cost of longer-term productivity growth. On the other hand, adopting policies that enhance the opportunity for all citizens to reap the rewards of their efforts could enhance productivity growth. Of course, tax policies and print spending priorities as well as financial regulation and trade policies will also play a role. Most economists see our tax code as nothing short of Byzantine with inefficient complexity, loopholes, special interest provisions that distort incentives and distort the allocation of resources. Most economists would agree that simplifying and enhancing the efficiency of our tax system by lowering tax rates, closing loopholes, and broadening the base could enhance productivity growth for our country. Tax and government spending policies that put our fiscal affairs back on a sustainable path and increase the incentives for private capital investment, R&D, education, and training could be beneficial as well. Financial regulations that work to ensure that our markets are transparent can improve efficiency and enhance productivity. For example, investors are attracted to our financial markets when they know that the rules provide a level playing field rather than favoring one set of participants over another. Similarly, regulatory reforms that penalize excessive risk-taking 
and create incentives for the appropriate level of risk taking in our financial markets can also pr improve our long-term growth prospects. But regulations and supervisory steps that would dramatically reduce the risks of failure or of financial or industrial firms are likely to reduce productivity growth. In my view, government regulations should seek to enhance the effectiveness and incentives of market participants to discipline a firm's risk taking, not try to supplant it with regulators. Regulations should work to enhance market discipline. I should add that excessive compliance costs in either the tax system or the regulatory system can also be sources of both inefficiency and reduced productivity growth. Just thus, the choices we make in response to the Great Recession can be a major factor in determining whether longer-term productivity growth and potential growth rates in the United States declines or not. This is not meant to be a pessimistic story. Indeed, I am generally an optimist and have been for a long time. I'm a strong believer in the resilience of our market economy. But I must say, we should choose wisely. Crises sometimes lead to overreaction by policymakers and in the demands of the public. We must seek to achieve an appropriate balance. In summary, the U.S. economy is continuing to grow at a moderate pace. I expect annual growth of around 3% over the next two years. Prospects for labor markets will continue to improve, but only gradually. I think we'll reach unemployment rates of close to 7% by the end of this year. I believe inflation expectations will be stable. Inflation will be, made, will be moderate over the near term. However, the very accommodative stance of our monetary policy in place has been in place for more than four years now, and our efforts to increase that accommodation as we are doing now, we must guard against the medium and longer term risks of inflation. How the economy and the standard of living of our citizens ultimately fare over the longer run will ultimately be determined by the cho policy choices we make in the aftermath of the Great Recession. Some of these increases, uh, some, some of these policies could increase the quality of our country's labor force, make us more competitive, and others may reduce volatility, but also reduce our longer-term growth prospects. It definitely behooves us to make those choices wisely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Plosser. <clears throat> My next is we're going to introduce Mr. Glassman, who's in Princeton, New Jersey right now at his home, and we've got to make sure he's awake uh, <laughs> and not asleep. Are you there, Tim? I am. Oh, good. Okay, good. Uh, Jim Glassman is the managing director of J.P. Morgan Chase's uh, and head of our <clears throat> economic function for the commercial bank. He works closely with the bank's chief investment officers, uh, the commercial bank, the investment bank, and our government relations groups. He publishes an independent research on the principal forces shaping the economy and financial markets. Uh, from 1979 through 1988, Mr. Glassman served as a member in areas of research and statistics and monetary affairs divisions at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C. He joined J.P. Morgan Chase and company in 1988. He has earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois and his uh, PhD in economics from Northwestern University. Uh, I have the great opportunity every Monday morning uh, at about 6.30 to turn on my <coughs> phone and listen to Mr. Glassman and uh, through the whole, I would say, 2012, um, he has been the most upbeat economist that uh, I've listened to. So, Jim, you're on. Thank you, Sandy. <clears throat> Greetings, everybody, and um, Charlie, Mark, Sandy, thank you. You know, life is a lot more challenging when you're, you, when you're dealing with colleagues who grew up in the boarding, in the boarding school because, as you may know, you spend 99% of your life dreaming up pranks. And that's, uh, that's what I deal with with Sandy. <laughs> you know, um, uh, disclaimer, uh, my views aren't necessarily the views of J.P. Morgan. And in this era of personal responsibility, uh, just to make sure my bases are covered, they may not even reflect my own views. 
So, um, you know, most, most conversations about the economy tend to orbit around three big issues that, that I want to throw out, some ideas. One, the, the recovery, what are we in the middle of, what's going on with our job market. Uh, secondly, the fiscal debate, which really consumes the political debate that we're having. And the third issue, uh, what's happening to our middle class? You hear there's all kinds of telltale signs of, of stress socially. And I, and I think it's important to try to get our hands around that. I'll throw out a couple ideas. I don't think we economists really have come to grips with all of it yet because things aren't quite working the way we all learned in school. But I think it's worth, um, it's worth highlighting some important things that are going on because I personally think behind the scenes in what we're seeing, which is a lot of stress, behind the scenes there are really favorable things going on that are driving this, even though it is creating a lot of chaos. So on, on first turning to the outlook, uh, the economic outlook, turn to the, the, first, the, the second chart there, the page number two on the chart, shows the uh, stock market. Top line is the U.S. stock market. The bottom line is everybody else. And I think, you know, I like to look at the stock market because, frankly, this is where you and I, this, this reflects what you and I think, not necessarily what we say. And an awful lot of what you hear over the airwaves is, uh, you know, it's, it's who, who knows what the motivation behind it is, but I think I've always learned as an economist, pay attention to what the market's doing because that's telling you what we're really thinking. You know, and, and what the picture shows you is the, the ratio of stock prices relative to where we were at the peak in, back in October 2007. And what the picture shows you, the U.S. market, the black line, we lost half the value of the stock market back there in the recession. We have fully recovered. So, you know, despite what we all say, despite the uncertainty that we're dealing with in terms of political uncertainty, and despite the angst about the recovery, essentially the, the equity market is fully recovered from where we were. It's fully recovered the losses. Now, if you go to the next picture, I personally think that the poster child of the fundamental health of the U.S. economy and, and what's going on underneath it all is echoed in this picture, which is showing you uh, after-tax profits of American businesses. Uh, we Businesses did a phenomenal job. You know, in the, in coming out of the, the credit crunch, uh, folks had to get, folks had to figure out how to survive, and they did they, they basically got to work, rebuilt profitability. Here we are today, profit margins at all-time highs. What's significant to me about this is that when, when margins are at, at all-time highs and have recovered, what it tells you is whatever we think about the landscape, we in the business community have a very powerful incentive to think forward, to, to, to plan on recovery, to plan on expansion. And, and frankly, everything we see from the business community whether it's uh, hiring, new hiring plans, whether it's capital spending, uh, everything that we see is really signaling that the business community has moved from defensive mode to offensive mode. And I think, uh, by the way, uh, if, you, if you look at this picture, what you see is a secular trend in profit margins. Uh, I think this is the big story. I think this is the story about what's going on globally, and I'll touch on that a little later. Um, I think this is... Uh, to, to me, it's very hard to be pessimistic about the outlook when you think about the things that might be driving this. This picture, by the way, is uh, doing things that we economists, uh, we're never taught this. We, we're always, we're sort of taught that in developed economies, uh, income shares tend to be pretty stable. Things get out of line and they revert to something more normal. Something, if, if something big is going on, and I think this picture is touching a, a lot of that. Now, um, Go to the next picture, page four. To me, uh, what I'm showing you here is the ratio of employment. The shaded area is national economy relative to where we were back in 2000, fourth quarter 2000. What the shaded area tells you is the, the economy has been, re been recovering and it's pretty steady. Um, we have recovered, businesses have created or replaced about half the jobs that were lost in the recession. Now, what's kind of amazing to me uh, is what's on those two lines. The red line is the state of New York. The yellow line is Rochester. Uh, what, what they show you is that employment has fully retraced the losses from the recession. This is a story you'll see in states like Texas, Oklahoma, uh, North Dakota, um, uh, 
places where the where the, the, there's the new energy going on in the in the energy field um, that that really never really suffered that much from the real estate debacle, and and obviously states that have enjoy energy assets uh, are doing really well. But to me, what's interesting is you don't find anybody who isn't benefiting from an energy boom, uh, except for New York that has fully recovered their their job base. So. I, I think uh, what, it tell, what the picture tells you, first of all, you get the impression that the recovery is going, it's, um, it's steady, and my expectation is we're going to see this trend continue as we go forward. Now, the, the thing is, it is slow, for sure. It's slower than we're used to when the economy goes into a deep dive. But I, actually, when you look at this picture, you see, you know, it sort of looks very similar, actually, to the last, to, to what we saw in the last recovery. And I think, though, it's worth stepping back for just a minute, highlighting a couple of things that might be behind the slow. So if you go to the next picture, page five, um, what it shows you is the trends that have been, the trends in Europe. Now Europe, as you know, uh, we had an existential crisis last year um, as a result of the deficit problems they've got, which are very similar to ours actually. Markets began to wonder whether this whole experiment made any sense. And Shocking as it is to any of us who've been living with this for a couple of decades, people actually began to question the credibility, the sustainability of the European Monetary Union. And as a result of that, it forced some of the weaker links to take actions that actually slowed them down a lot. So this picture is showing you the economic, economic activity for the European Union, the 27-member union. And what it shows you is they had been growing about 2.5% a year ago, um, last year they stalled. Uh, this was a particularly big deal for the developing world because the developing economies, their, their economies still depend very much on exports to all of us. So when an important partner like Europe stalls, this is the reason why a lot of these developing economies slow down. The, the interesting thing is that, yes, we felt it, but the truth is uh, it didn't slow us down. We just continued to move steadily. Um, to me, this, is, uh, this has been an important headwind that is beginning to shift. And this for, the, the picture here shows you what my uh, colleagues, what we're forecasting for the coming year. We expect, we think that the crisis is fading or passing, hasn't been resolved. The political leaders have to come up with more ideas to develop the project that they began several decades ago. But what we're expecting, when you look at the plans for fiscal austerity in the European region, it, it's expected to be lighter, therefore we're expecting growth to pick up. So to me, one, one, one important thing that has been at work in the last year is this, this stall in Europe has been a bit of a headwind. Now if you go to the next picture, page six, focuses on the fiscal, uh, what's been going on in the fiscal situation. Now there's many layers to fiscal policy. Um, as a result of the agreement uh, on uh, December 31st, payroll taxes are going up a fair amount. The payroll tax cut uh, was allowed to expire. And so there are, and there are things that we don't know yet what the resolution of the sequestration debate is going to be in the debt ceiling issue. But the thing to remember is that fiscal policy, th there's another layer to fiscal policy, and that is we pumped in a lot of money back in 2009 and 2010, and by design, fiscal policy was planned to wind down. And that's what's been going on for the past couple of years. The, the picture here is showing you the contribution of spending by the public sector to the economy. And what it shows you is, aside from the things that we're focused on right now, in the background, fiscal policy has shifted from being a cushion a couple of years ago to unwinding. And so this is the reason, by the way, when you look at overall GDP growth, it's been kind of slow, around 2% a year. If you take out the public sector, including the state and local area, GDP has actually been growing about 3 to 3.5% which uh, is a reminder that away from the fiscal side, the, the economy actually is doing quite well. It has a pretty decent foundation. Finally, um, the next picture, page seven, the housing drag. As, as you know, I mean, we made a lot of mistakes in the last decade. Uh, we overbuilt, across the country, there was a lot of overbuilding and it was a reflection, the result of all the easy credit. Um, and for the first time, so any of us can remember, we've had a recovery that was not accompanied by a recovery in the housing sector. That's a really big deal because usually 
from the housing sector, when housing is recovering, you usually get a half a point to a full point of growth initially uh, from, from a recovery in the housing sector. That has not happened until now. So actually you could argue it's pretty interesting that we've had a recovery, slow as it is, we've had a recovery even without the housing sector. Well, that's changing, and I think 2013 is going to be a different story. As you can always already tell, home construction is picking up, house prices are beginning to go up, and the reason, the reason for this is several fold. Number one, the builders have been underbuilding for a while, for the last couple of years, and as a result, they've got their inventories back down to something more reasonable. So that big supply gut that built up in the last decade is really behind us. Um, number two, um, financing conditions are really quite attractive, thanks to the Fed. Uh, number three, something important has been going on on the demand side. As everybody probably knows, because they may own some of these, the, 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 the recession that we just went through was particularly harsh for young people, people coming out of college. So maybe folks are still at home, maybe they've had to double up. Um, the population that's 20 to 34 years of age was really affected severely by this downturn. It's, it's, a, it's a sign of the times, actually. If you don't have the experience and the skills in a time when businesses are having to survive, you're going to have to wait. And, that's, and I, think, I think that's part of what's going on here with, uh, with folks who are um, just coming out of college. Well, but, but the interesting and the, and the good thing about this is that in the last year, the job market for young people, 25 to 34 years of age, is improving significantly. And on the margin, it's that age group that's seeing the job market open up the most. And you see this when you look at the ratio of uh, people who are uh, the employment to population ratio for different age groups. It's, it's the college graduating age group that's really seeing the, most, the biggest improvement. Well, that's a big deal for the housing industry because it's, it's folks coming out of college wanting to start their own life um, that that really drives some of the, the, the need for housing. So we're starting to see household formation rates picking up. Uh, and, and my guess is this is going to continue to open up in the coming year and, and represents yet one more phenomenon supporting the housing market. And by the way, when you have household formation stall out like it did for the last couple of years, what that means is there's a huge built up, pent up demand building up uh, as people get jobs and can launch on their own, they're going to they're gonna want to leave family, they want to they leave, there's a big population that's been doubling up. Uh, that's going to be driving the housing market for the next couple of years. There's about 3 million people who are in, these, in this situation who have had to suspend life because they had a hard time getting a job. They're beginning to see a change in that. So um, po positive trends here in the housing sector, and I think a new, a new story uh, for 2013. Now, just a quick comment uh, on the picture on page eight. When I, uh, folks are, um, when I travel around the country, folks are really bothered by a lot of what the Fed is doing because we learn in school that when the central bank buys assets, it, it creates reserves that then turn into money and that, that makes people think there's a big inflation problem coming. I think the thing to remember is that what's going on right now is nothing that we learned in school. And the way to think about this is, you know, we, we never really learn how it is that the reserves the Fed creates turn into money. It's a partnership with the banking system. The banks have, have to lend those reserves to, to, the, uh, to businesses, which then turns into money. This picture is telling you there's something really unusual going on, the picture on page, page 8. Um, the, the top black line is the explosion in the monetary base, which is an echo of the asset purchases by the Fed. The bottom line is the Fed's money, is the money supply which tells you there's something different going on here than, than, um, than uh, what, we, what we learned. And I think it's, it's this picture that tells you um, when people say the Fed's monetizing debt, quantitative easing, it really isn't a very accurate description of what's going on. Uh, it's not, it's not what, what the Fed is doing is not really being monetized. What it is doing, though, by taking assets out of the market is dampening interest rates. And the picture on the next page, page 9, kind of is a story that we're all, we economists are all supposed to warn you of. That, you know, the benefits of what the Fed is, what the Fed is doing is it's helping to uh, encourage risk appetites, helping to move credit out to areas that were starved. But we should all know that this is not forever. 
And I think the way to see this is this picture is showing you um, the five by five forward rate. So what the market thinks the five year rate will be five years from now, and the blue line is the real rate. And I, I show you the five by, you know, what the market thinks the rate will be in five years from now, because most of us don't think the Fed is going to be having rates at these unusually low levels uh, beyond five years. And to me, that blue line, that blue shaded area is telling you something about the impact of Fed, Fed asset purchases on real rates. This is very unusual. Real interest rates typically, historically, for 100 years have been somewhere between 2 and 3 percent. So when actions are taken to drive that real rate down to zero, it's telling you this is not forever. We should know that in time this is going to change as the economy recovers, as I think it is. Now, uh, two more things. Next page shows you the challenge for the Fed in terms of the unemployment rate. You know, the, the shaded area here is showing you the percent of the population that's unemployed. Now, you know, because, because the baby boom generation is retiring, there are more people who are slowly moving into retirement. That's probably, that's been going on, but that's not the main reason why the percent of the population that's unemployed exploded like it did back in 2008 and 9. And the, the, the point of this is to remind us that it's really a little, it's really a challenge to figure out what is the true unemployment. The black line is showing you the official unemployment rate as a percent of the population. Um, the, the government, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics also asks people, of you folks who are unemployed and not showing up in the unemployment statistics, how many of you want a job? And that's what that yellow line is showing you to get at how many people have disappeared from the job market that don't show up in the statistics but might have just gotten discouraged and maybe went back to school, hopefully. Um, but it's trying to capture the hidden unemployment that we think is going on because it's a little unusual to see the unemployment rate coming down by a percentage point a year when the economy is growing this slowly. So the, the labor market has really changed in character. It seems like the labor supply is a lot more flexible. When the opportunities dry up, people seem to disappear more quickly. So for the Fed, the question is, what's the true unemployment rate? The way you really, you know, and, and where are we going? It seems like the trends are improving. It seems like the situation is improving, but um, you, you really never really completely know until you see what's going on with inflation. Now, I think the thing to remember, a lot of folks, uh, we, we hear a lot about the unemployment, the employment mandate. I think one of the most significant things the Fed did uh, happened last year, a year ago, when, when, when the Fed decided to put a numerical number on their inflation goal. If you look at the next page, page 11, uh, you know, we, we, we economists always sort of disagree about where the full employment level is. But the way I think about this is unemployment is kind of an intermediate target. It's something that you've got to pay attention to. It, gui it may guide your thinking about inflation for some people. I think at the end of the day, the way to think about this is the Fed really is not torn. It's not like, it's not like they're ignoring their inflation mandate at the risk of trying to get the economy reemployed. At the end of the day, um, inflation is the ultimate mandate. It's the ultimate goal. And the way you know that is if you ask FOMC members, well, what is your inflation goal? They've told you it's 2%. There's no disagreement on that. If you ask them what level of unemployment you think is consistent with a stable, non-inflationary environment, we differ. We don't know. We're, it's something we're going to learn as we go through time. I think at the end of the day, the thing to remember is inflation um, is, is the ultimate goal for the Fed. It's not a problem, which is what this picture shows you. Um, and that's why you could argue for, all, for, the, for the unusual things the Fed is doing, the fact is inflation is at or slightly below their long-run target. So it's not inconsistent with what they have been doing. Now, next page. Let's go to the fiscal issue. It's a big story. I'm just going to give you a couple ideas. Um, I think the way to think about this is play a little game of Jeopardy. Um, it was nothing in 2007. We weren't talking about the deficit in 2007 before the economy fell into recession. Number two, interest rates have come down even though the federal deficit has exploded. Number three, the Congressional Budget Office is projecting over the next 10 years, that's what that line shows you, that the deficit will come back down on the assumption that the economy recovers to full employment. The question is, what is a cyclical deficit? 
But now what that picture shows you is what the real issue is. What, 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 what that picture shows you is the Congressional Budget Office's forecast for what the deficit will look like in the future, assuming that revenues stay about where they have been, about 18% of GDP, if we don't do something, if we don't do something to control the growth of government spending. What it shows you is today's cyclical deficit is expected to come down, but that cyclical deficit is going to give way to a growing structural deficit. And if you ask, well, what's behind that? Uh, if, you look at, if you look at various pieces of government spending, what you'll see is, is one, obvious, one obvious thing. Of course, when you, when you go into recession, all these counter-cyclical programs, spending programs, kick up. Revenues dry up. But if you look at uh, the various components of, of government spending, what you'll notice is that health care spending is on a steady ascent. Government spending for health care was about 1% of GDP back in 1970. Today it's about 5.5%, rising steadily. The Congressional Budget Office projects that in the next two decades, health care spending by the federal government is going to be growing to 25%. And what that tells you, if we don't do anything, uh, our, our, our structural deficit would mount. And this would, do, this would be a, a, a very difficult thing for the economy. What we know is there is no way we can finance a structural deficit and get away with it. You can, you can finance a large deficit if it's a result of the, a bad economy. A cyclical deficit does not have the same impact on interest rates as a structural deficit. Everybody knows this is the problem. So this is why I think the important I, – I hear a lot of criticism about what's been going on, that, that, that the fiscal cliff deal didn't, do, didn't really address the spending issue. I think you have to think about this as a, process, a project that's going to meet, be many rounds. I think what we've learned – about the political debate right now is that we've locked down the ta the public does not have much of an appetite for more taxes that's what that's what that agreement is doing and what that means is we're going to have to figure out to 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 deal with this issue we're going to have to address the spending side it's not so much spending today it's really changing reforming the health care system and health care programs that is what's needed. So you don't have to do anything that would hurt the economy today. What we need to do is figure out how to get smart about how we're going to be managing health care resources in the future. I really am optimistic about this myself, despite the fact that we haven't seen anything on spending yet, because I think the political conversation has changed. We are now recognizing that entitlement spending is an important issue. And now the next debate that we're going to have in two months or a month and a half the next debate has turned, the focus has turned to spending. And, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not something we're going to solve right away. It's going to take probably a decade of layer after layer uh, to try to figure out how to do this. But the, but the issue I think everybody is aware of, and I think this is a way to understand why it is that massive deficits you're watching today aren't having much of an effect on the market, because the real issue is what lies down the, down the road. Trust me, if, if, um, if, if out of the political battle that goes on right now, if out of this we get just the tiniest down payment on some kind of reform to entitlement programs, the market is going to like that. The market's going to think uh, we're finally getting a grip on, on the real problem, not, the, not today's deficit. Finally, third issue, the, the stress that we're all dealing with. People, there's a lot of anxiety because um, it's a tough time, and it's a tough time for certain kinds of people. I think, you know, the, the – uh, to me, you, you see the symptoms of this debate in the Occupy Wall Street phenomenon, the worry about the, the top 1%, in the, the distribution of income has gotten a little out of skew. I think the thing, the New York Fed analysts have written an interesting note that point out that the folks who have a lot of, the folks who are high skilled or no skills, job growth has been pretty decent. It's people in the middle that are having a difficult time. And I think, um, you know, this, this is something I hear all the time when I'm visiting, visiting business clients who are in the manufacturing side. They're saying it's very difficult to get people. I think there's two things going on that, that we're sort of aware of, but we haven't really got our hands around. Number one, there's been an awful lot of innovation in the last, in the last decade and a half, and that innovation has really displaced an awful lot of jobs 
that uh, jobs that could have been, you know, if you go to the auto plant, you can see it. The jobs that, uh, that are routine skills. Uh, people who have, you know, middle skills, they're the ones that got displaced. And I think the other thing that's going on is globalization. Manufacturers have gotten very clever about unbundling the manufacturing process, and so they've taken pieces. Pieces can be farmed out to different parts of the world to take advantage of the different costs around the world. And you, you, see, you see, to me, the face of this process, what's creating a lot of this problem for workers that don't have much skill, is kind of visible in the picture on page 13. Um, and I apologize, the picture is, the subtitle is slightly mislabeled. The top red line is labor productivity. The, the scale is on the left-hand side. The blue line is real labor compensation. That scale is on the left-hand side. The shaded area is a measure of income distribution. When that line goes, when the shaded area goes up, it means the income distribution is getting a little skewed. What, what the picture shows you is something really telling for economists. Normally, you expect in a modern, developed economy when income shares are stable, you expect labor pay, real labor pay, to pretty much match trends in labor productivity. What this picture tells you is some, something has, this has become decoupled in the last 15 years. That, that productivity is doing quite well, but it's not showing up in terms of pay. It's showing up more in terms of, if you remember that picture on, on, on corporate profitability. And I think um, that's what you see on the next page 14. I'm just repeating the, the, the corporate profit picture. I think these two are connected. And I think the way to think about this is this is really the face of globalization. If manufacturers can unbundle their process and then you locate these various pieces wherever it's most attractive, it's the reason, it's the reason why you're seeing so much displacement of jobs that are kind of sort of mid-skill level. And I think this is really the heart of what's going on in, in a lot of the anxiety about uh, life is getting more competitive for American workers. Now, you could look at this you could look at this and say, well, this is, this is bad news. And um, I tend to think, though, this, what you are watching play out here is not a symptom of an exhausted giant, that, that, the, the life is, that, that we're just running out of ideas. To me, what we are watching is a symptom of innovation, and we've been able to do an awful lot more with the kind of information technology that we've been developing in the last 15 years. And it's related to a world around us that's waking up. So if you go to that last picture, page 15, it shows you uh, the GDP per 7 billion people. Of the 7 billion people, the GDP per person of the world's population. And it tells you we are in the middle of a new, a new renaissance, frankly. And so I, I tend to think that, yes, the, the things that we see around us, life is more competitive for our workers in the developed world. It's a more stressful world, but the truth is what's driving these trends is new economic life, and life is getting more competitive. So, um, you know, getting back, to, getting back to Earth in terms of where we are now and for the year, I think I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with Charlie. I think we've got an ongoing recovery. I think this year, once we get over the near-term hurdle of uh, payroll taxes going up, and I, th I think that the 2013 is going to be a better year than what we had the last year because I think a lot of these headwinds are dying down. And I think we're on the way to a, a recovery that's, frankly, still going to take quite a few years to get there. But I think we're on the way, and I think the trends we've been seeing for the last several years tell you it may not be overwhelming, but it's pretty steady. So I'm, I'm optimistic about what lies ahead of us for 2013, and I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Jim. We have time for a few questions. I'm curious whether the principle of Keynesian economics, where you get a better feedback than what you spend to stimulate the economy, would help with our fiscal crisis that we're facing now. Uh, Jim, if you didn't hear the question, uh, do the principles of Keynesian economics, would they uh, uh, promote a better outcome at the present time? So the question is, more would more Spending be good for the economy? Is that what you're saying? Yes. No, you know, I think, 
Um, is that, I mean, this is controversial, right? Um, I think uh, there's not much appetite for more spending. And, and I, think, I think the problem that we all, all, you know, when we get into trouble and we do a free fall, uh, we tend to, no matter who we are, Republican or Democrat, we've always uh, used fiscal policy pretty aggressively to try to cushion things. But the thing to remember is that um, fiscal policy does not, the government doesn't grow the economy. It's the private sector that does. So I think, I think these measures work. They help us out when we're in, when there are extreme things going on. But the truth is we've got to stand back and let the economy, uh, we've got to let, let the private sector figure out where is the best place to put resources. The, the problem is the private sector knows better than the public sector. So I, I think, I think when, I, when I look at what's going on right now with the economy, I, see, I don't see anything wrong with the economy. I think we've made a lot of mistakes the last decade. We've corrected a lot of those. And I think we've just got to be patient uh, that there are things happening here that are taking us in the right direction. And I think uh, we, we've got to be patient. But I think the private sector is going to be doing a better job getting us back than if we came along and did something new. Charlie? Yeah. I would, I would simply point out that um, if you think of the, the Great Recession, what we've just been through, it has been an extraordinary experience in some of the most aggressive fiscal policy and most aggressive monetary policy this country's ever seen. In terms of, you saw Jim's graph about the magnitude of government spending and the deficits we ran, which is usually the measure of fiscal thrust that most Keynesians point to. Um, record attempts to use fiscal policy and extraordinary attempts to use monetary policy. The question is, is as we both noted, is that, well, you know, it hasn't been, neither of those have sort of resulted in some sort of magic panacea that has gotten the economy really growing very fast. And so I'm not sure that the evidence supports the notion that somehow if we just keep doing more of either one of those things, that that's going to affect the, out, the outcomes very much. It's mostly going to be about the private sector and how they and how they respond, as Jim suggested. So we've done we've done pretty pretty record experiments in both fiscal and monetary stimulus, um, and indeed in the monetary side, we're content trying to do even more. Um, so there's a hypothesis here. You could hypothesize that well, the fact that we haven't recovered any faster than we have is because we haven't done enough, or you could have the hypothesis that says well. Maybe it doesn't work quite the way we thought it worked. And so that's going to be a big question mark. But I, I think it's pretty hard to make the case that we haven't, this government in general, both monetary and fiscal policy, hasn't been extraordinarily stimulative by any, uh, by any measure of what economists would call that. So, uh, This is directed primarily to Mr. Flosser. Um, correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but it sounded like at the outset uh, you described uh, savings and debt instruments is sort of an inferior good where the worse the return is, the more money people want to put into them because they need a certain you know, amount of income from those. Um, I'm just wondering if there's uh, like what research you've seen of that that explains that when it seems like there's a lot of alternatives both in terms of um, you know, stocks, uh, even lending money to someone to start a business, starting your own business, and so on. <coughs> The, the, the really simple message there is that um, what we're seeing is an environment where uh, households are basically still deleveraging. They're trying to get to, a, it's a statement about their balance sheet, not about inferior or superior goods and so forth. So it's about, it's about stocks, it's about wealth. And so um, uh, that's what's driving the, the mechanism here, not some sort of traditional income effect. Uh, it's it's not, what, not, not what it's worth. For one last quick question. You hear a lot of pessimism about the impact of the national debt. Uh, I'd be interested in your view on uh, what you see that impacting uh, our economy. Um, Jim, question for you as well. Yeah. Pessimism about yeah. the national debt. Yeah, you know, debt. I think the market gives you an answer to this. And right now, the answer is it's a fairly benign answer, but that's why. Because I, I think the real an the answer to this is, if it if it if it harms the economy, it's because it starts driving interest rates up, and this is why it's so important to get our grip, get our hands around the real problem, which is going to be looming, and 
uh, see what, 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 we're, what we're learning, what the bond market's telling you is that a cyclical deficit that has driven up the debt, um, it's not having an impact on the economy or interest rates because it's a reflection of, of the economic downturn. So getting the economy back to health is going to help to bring the deficit back down to a sustainable level, which means that the debt ratio won't keep rising. But, but, the, but the warning to all of us is that uh, th this is not going to go on forever. If we don't get a grip on the longer term, the underlying entitlement problem, then we're going to have a growing structural deficit. The debt burden would continue to grow, and that, would, that is what would do great damage. The, the damage to the economy would be what it does to underlying interest rates, which then, you know, if it's, if it's pushing interest rates up, starts choking off investment spending. That's where, that's, where the, uh, that's where the economy is really severely harmed. We're not there yet because we're still dealing with much of our deficit issues, and the debt issue is about the recession. It's all sort of tied together. Um, let me just close. We had an alumni event uh, last Thursday evening in Singapore and had last been there 19 years ago, and it was growing quickly then but it was amazing how much has occurred in the intervening 19 years on this small island state and your first impression is it's very hot and it's incredibly humid, who would ever want to live there? And then you uh, disentangle why it's growing, it attests to what uh, Charlie mentioned earlier, first uh, trade matters, it's located in a very uh, strategically beneficial spot, uh, the connections to China, the Malacca Straits, capturing those uh, gains from trade education. It's a very, uh, like the Chinese culture, a very uh, education-driven city-state. Uh, China itself, last 15 years, has gone from 6% of people going to college to over uh, close to 30%. So this real drive to investing in the future and productivity. And then uh, a real strong emphasis on creating growth through the private sector in terms of tax rates, the share of the uh, GDP that's accounted for by the government and even uh, parliamentary members and policymakers, they're paid on the basis of uh, GDP performance. So very directly tied to how well the city-state does economically. And you compare ourselves, I would argue in our case, uh, as a political economy scholar, uh, our policymakers are almost paid the exact opposite fashion. Uh, whether it's uh, interest group capture or government capture, and that's the big worry, and uh, Jim alluded to it with the structural deficits uh, that are growing. Uh, taking care of the folks back home or myself uh, poses the biggest threat uh, because the job growth does come through the private sector. So that's something to keep in mind. We've done well relative to the rest of the world, like Jim alluded to, but uh, that is probably the biggest fear from an economist's perspective going forward. We're delighted you were able to join us. If there are any ways we can be of help to you, uh, if you're looking for talent, uh, we've got quite a few uh, students with us in attendance tonight. Uh, let me or anybody, or with us today, let me know, or anybody else on our team. And uh, they have an especial love for Rochester once they come to study at Simon, and we'd love to provide more of a dating service to make that happen. If we can help uh, through educational programs, whether it's the MBA, the part-time MBA, EMBA, we have a variety of new one-year options in pricing and business analytics. Uh, let us know and we'll get you details. Uh, if we can connect you around the country, around the globe, um, we have 12,000 alums, 130 different countries. So if you do business in different parts of the world that we can help draw a connection, let us know. Uh, we're delighted you were able to join us. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, RBA, uh, the CFA Society of Rochester, and uh, JP Morgan. I uh, want to thank Charlie and Jim for being our keynote speakers, to Sandy for helping to emcee it. Uh, Happy New Year to you all. <laughs>